Thank you, Tony. Um, hey, look, I know it's really close to the end of the day. It's been a long day, so I'm going to try very hard not to bore you too much. Um, so we're going to talk about UI. We're going to talk about UX. Um, I, I promised you some memes, right? So let's, let's kick off with some memes. So I think that ground zero for the whole uh, UI, UX, what is it kind of meme is probably this one here. You've seen this, yeah? So I guess the idea here is that um, uh, the, the, this represents the intention of some uh, designer, presumably sitting in some high tower of the municipal planning department or something, and, and this one represents the, the will of the people. This is what, how people actually really want to use uh, system. So I suppose this resonated with people because they started to spot it uh, all sorts of places. Uh, this one looks to me like eventually someone's going to have a very bad user experience. But uh, when you think about it, uh, this idea is, is kind of a bit funny really because it sort of suggests that uh, design and user experience, user interface and user experience, that somehow that they are antagonistic to each other. That they, um, al almost that user experience is not something that a designer intends, it's something that just happens. And so the counter memes came along and they started to point out things like, well actually that's just really a path. And, another path, and then as usually happens in this sort of situation, along come the thought leaders with their think pieces on uh, Medium, debunking the bad UX memes and uh, you know, other platforms. And so at this point, uh, the meme artists, this is like an oral history of the UI UX meme, at this point the meme artists, they had to, uh, they had to move on, they had to find another uh, field of expression. And so the next uh, battleground for the UI UX meme, oddly enough, was tomato sauce. So uh, we have this one, and this one I guess suggests that again on this side we have uh, some highfalutin designer who wants this beautiful bottle that is oriented in the way that we've always oriented bottles in their labels, but then UX comes along and says, well you know what, uh, it might be a little bit counterintuitive, might be even a little bit ugly, but what if we flip the bottle around and put the label the other way around? Uh, that would be a better user experience. Well, you know, again, this is, this is kind of a weird idea, right? Again, this sort of antagonism between the two and, um, and, and almost suggesting that user experience uh, improves on user interface. And so again, the counter memes, um, I'm not really completely sure what this is suggesting. I guess that even the usability version, the UX version rather, has its own usability issues. Uh, or this one, which correctly points out really, actually these are just two different user interfaces. Uh, and the only difference really is that this one has a, a frustrating user experience and this one has a, like a delicious user experience. So, and, and then of course, then again, the think pieces on Medium uh, debunking even these uh, memes. So. At this point, the meme artists had to really diversify, and they did. They went out and they colonized all the corners of the meme universe. So we had, we had lots. We had, we had this one uh, with the guy from, um, from Lord of the Rings. We had this other guy <laughs> from Game of Thrones uh, suggesting that you can't become a UX designer in 10 weeks. Well, do who would think that you, oh, someone obviously thought that you can <laughs> become that. Um, we had, look, on, I've, got to, I've got to admit, I'm not great at these sort of pop culture references. I, I think this is Titanic, right? I'm pretty sure. Um, Seinfeld, I think. Uh, I know this one. This, uh, this is Karate Kid, yes? That, that's Mr., uh, Mr. Miyamoto from Karate Kid. Um, David Hasselhoff from his, uh, from his Baywatch days and David Hasselhoff as he looks today. Uh, another Game of Thrones, I think. Um, oh, wait. <laughs> I'm going to say Stranger Things. Uh, this one I like, I've used this one before. No idea what it means, but I, I like this one. Uh, sure, fair enough. Um, the Nutella, and a, is that a squirrel? I, I don't know. Uh, Star Wars characters, obviously. Um, this one is in French, uh, and it's kind of low res, so I don't know quite what it's saying, but there's an egg and some toast soldiers. Uh, this one introduces another dynamic of crabs. Uh, yeah, that's good, I like that. And, and last but not least, my personal favourite UI UX meme is this one right here. So at this point you would be forgiven for wondering what even is UX? What is user experience? What does it even mean? And if you are a bit confused by this then you're not alone because a lot of people are and in fact a lot of employers are. So I did a little uh, experiment. I went on to seek.com.au and I uh, I searched for job postings that mention UI and UX or both. 
And as you can see, uh, the vast majority of the first 100 posts uh, wanted someone to fulfill both of those roles. Although, if you are fairly quick on the old mental maths, you might see that this only adds up to 99 because there was one post in the first 100 looking for a UI designer slash UX slash UI designer. <laughs> So I, I wasn't really sure how to characterize that one. So anyway, but uh, clearly, at least in the mind of people who advertise for jobs on Seek, uh, there isn't a difference between these two things. Or, or perhaps you could say, you know, there is a difference because they listed both of them. But uh, for most of the people posting these ads, I guess the, the difference was so small that they generally expected they could find one person who would do both of these jobs. So. Uh, I thought I should actually just uh, double check that the, the sort of and or search filter things were working on Seek. So I tried the same thing with some different search terms. And yeah, look, it looks, <laughs> looks like it's working <laughs> as expected. So, all right, so, so what the hell? What's going on here? What even is UX? Well, it turns out, unlike a lot of terms that we use in, uh, in software, uh, in the software industry, uh, we actually know where this term comes from. We actually know the person it originated with. And the person uh, that, who sort of coined this phrase was an individual by the name of Don Norman. Now, Don Norman was... A... <laughs> what? Sorry. What's going on? Sorry, I, um, I outsourced the creation of my slides to um, someone on Fiverr.com. And uh, there might be some mistakes. Right, sorry, yeah, that's, that's weird. Uh, anyway, so uh, this is Don Norman, uh, the real Don Norman. So he was a, he was a cognitive um, scientist and an uh, industrial engineer, electrical engineer rather. And he went to work for Apple in the early 90s. Uh, he's become quite famous uh, since then. He's written a lot of books. Uh, this is probably his most famous one. I recommend it, The Design of Everyday Things. A lot of really useful stuff in there. So he went to work for Apple, and like all clever people, he wanted to come up with his own job title. And the job title he chose was a User Experience Architect. Now, there's a sort of fairly well-known quote from Don Norman. He said, he said this, he said, I invented the term because I thought human interface and usability were too narrow. I wanted to cover all aspects of the person's experience with the system, including industrial design, graphics, the interface, the physical interaction, and the manual. Now, since then, the term has spread widely, so much so that it is starting to lose its meaning. User experience, human-centered design, usability, all these things, even affordances. I've got to tell you, Don Norman has a real thing about people using the word affordances incorrectly, just in case you ever meet him. Um, they just sort of entered the vocabulary and no longer have any special meaning. People use them often without having any idea why, what the word means, its origin, its history, or what it's about. Now, when Don Norman said this two years ago, he was responding, no, actually that's not true. It sounds like something that might've been said two years ago, but in fact, he said this 20 years ago, all right? In 1998, and yeah, if, if you are like me and you remember 1998 really clearly, yep, I'm sorry, that was 20 years ago. We are getting quite old now. Uh, so if this was true back then, if these terms were a bit fuzzy around the edges and kind of bleeding into each other, how much more is that the case uh, today. So, uh, now this is my opinion. Uh, why such a confusion? Now, uh, um, this is not Mr. Norman's opinion. A lot of people here might disagree with this, but I believe that one of the core problems here is it's a naming problem, right? It's a naming issue. Because as you all know, right, there are only two difficult problems in design, right? There is, uh, there is cache invalidation. That's a you know, big problem for designers everywhere. <laughs> Uh, there's naming things, of course, well-known problem for designers. And of course, the joke goes, and there are off by one errors. So this one, this is, uh, that joke didn't land. They're, they're at lunch, it's at one o'clock. <sighs> anyway, so, um, that's, that's better. So, so this is a naming issue. Let me tell you what I mean by this. I mean, so, um, UX design stands for user experience uh, design. So this is designing the way that users will experience uh, a given system. Uh, UI design uh, means user interface design. And so obviously if you think, well, if a UX designer is designing a software system, then clearly they will spend a lot of time thinking about the design of the UI, of the user interface. Of course they will. I think that a better way of, of thinking about this 
uh, is to not so much think about this distinction, but to think about this distinction, the distinction between UI and UX design and graphic design. Now, I want to say something here. If you were in the session yesterday, this might seem like uh, like I'm contradicting or this is slightly different. And I want to be really clear that um, I don't think that UI and UX design are the same thing, right? I completely agree with the ideas expressed yesterday that, that UX is much, much broader than that. UX covers, uh, you know, systems thinking, covers strategic decisions, all of those things. And UI is, a, is a sort of a much smaller component of that. But what I'm saying is I think that um, this distinction between uh, UI and UX design and visual design, when people talk about uh, UX design, when people like uh, CEOs and uh, business analysts and people who are employing, when they say UX design, they generally are talking about the way that things work. And in my experience, when they're talking about UI design, they're often talking about uh, the way that things look. So uh, I'm going to give you some take homes today. This is kind of a little bit of a I guess a, a bit of a floaty talk, there's not a lot of practical stuff, but I want to try and give you some take homes. But obviously whether or not you take these home depends on whether you agree with me. So if you don't agree with me, you can consider these leave here's. But my take home first is quite simply to, uh, to say what you mean. All right, quite simply say what you mean. And you know, I'm not, I'm not telling you what to call these things. I'm not on some crusade to change language. But I guess I'm saying uh, when you're talking about some of these terms, maybe try to add context and specificity to what you're talking about. And don't assume that everyone has the same, I guess, shared understandings of what these terms mean. So uh, let's assume for just a moment that I have now totally cleared everything up. All right, it's all, it's all clear. This whole misunderstanding has been cleared away and we all know what these things are now. Well, what kind of different thinking is involved? What kind of different skills? Uh, what kind of thinking can we use to get better at both UI uh, and, and UX design or UX design and, and visual design? Well, there's lots and lots of ways that these two kinds of design are different, but I really today I'm just going to focus on one and it is the question of objectivity or in other words, uh, science. And it is my opinion that one of these fields of design is way more objective, way more science-based than the other. Um, little anecdote. So I remember having a robust conversation, not, not an argument, a robust conversation with a developer friend of mine around the time that iOS uh, 7 was um, revealed to the world. Uh, he hated it absolutely hated it. And he hated it not because he thought it was less usable, although he, he did. His real beef with iOS 7 was that he felt that it almost betrayed uh, everything that he had come to learn about good mobile design the whole time he'd been doing mobile development. So uh, he had read the, the HIG, the Human Interface Guidelines. Uh, he, had, he had studied that. And in particular, I remember he hated the borderless buttons. It's like, what the hell? The HIG says clearly that buttons are supposed to be clearly button-like, clearly tappable. He had um, gone and studied some Photoshop tutorials. He'd learned to make like a 15 layer, glossy, shiny button. And he's like, so what? Now all of that, good designs, that's just out the window just because some designers at Apple decided this looks better. Like, what the hell? That doesn't make sense. Where's the objectivity? Now, here's the thing. There are two aspects to the change from interface like this to interface like this. Uh, firstly, there is the issue of usability. How easy is it for users to discover and use the features that these interfaces afford? Um, and you can test that. Right? You can actually run experiments to determine, you know, you can give people a set of tasks, you can measure how many of those tasks they complete successfully, you can measure how long it takes to do it. Uh, you can prove that one or other of these interfaces is more usable than the other. You can prove it. But the other aspect is what these systems look like. It's the aesthetics. And I would argue that you can't prove that one or the other is more aesthetically pleasing. Now you might say, well, you could run an opinion poll or you could, you know, you could survey people. You could ask a thousand people which of these they prefer. And, you know, if one is more, you know, statistically significantly more preferred than the other, then you've proved that it's more aesthetically pleasing. But have you? Have you really? Or have you just proved that more people said it was or thought it was in that instance? Now, remember, there was a big backlash against iOS 7, right? Lots of people didn't like it. Many people, they, they refused to update their phones and they held out as long as they could and when they couldn't hold out any longer, they 
you know, they, they, they left Apple and they're millions and they're hundreds of millions. Remember, they flocked to Android and Windows Phone and Blackberry and, you know, they had a huge resurgence and there were protests in the street. Remember, <laughs> people were, people were firebombing the Apple stores and, oh my goodness, who could forget? Who could forget Johnny Ives' emotional apology? <laughs> Remember when Apple had to like recant and, and, and reverse and take back iOS 7, revert back to iOS 6, but then it was too late and you know the stock price. <laughs> no, no, that, that didn't happen. Well, actually, this did happen. This, this is a real screenshot from the Stocks app, but this is, this is not Apple. This is actually Facebook. From <laughs> uh, so... So no, it was fine, right? It was fine. Some people didn't like it, they didn't update, they waited, and then, you know, they had to get a new phone. And by that stage, you know, they got, got used to it, and frankly, all of the operating systems had all gone in this direction, and it was fine. Now, does the fact that there was a mixed reaction to iOS 7, does that prove that these were bad aesthetic choices, or does that just prove that people really, really don't like change? Yeah, exactly, right? And conversely, does the fact that this has proved to be quite long-lasting, right? I always, you know, we've got fatter fonts and there's some more depth creeping back in, but, you know, it still looks more like this than like this. And like I said, all the, uh, you know, software looks more like this now. Does that prove that these are good aesthetic choices or does it just prove that all the companies copy each other and they don't like to change their mind? Um, now you might say, well, come on, James, there's got to be some science, there's got to be some objective. What about colour theory? Right? What about that? Well, sure, you're right, there are some empirical reasons why certain combinations of things tend to look better together than others. But I would still argue that doesn't mean you can prove that something is aesthetically pleasing, because here's the thing. We're not talking here about beauty, uh, at least not in the sort of um, the pure in a platonic way, we're not talking about beauty. What we're talking about here is what is fashionable or what's trendy. And that's why my friend like, struggled to get his head around it because fashion is not logical. It's not, uh, it's not logical. And in fact, fashion often is not about what is beautiful. Uh, fashion, a lot of the time, is actually about flirting with what is ugly. Now, I read a really interesting post about this, probably on Medium, a few years ago. Wanted to find it and show you a bit of it. I couldn't find it. So the closest I could find was this quote by, I don't even know who this guy is, some random guy writing on the internet. I don't even actually know if this photo was really him. I, I think it is. You know, it doesn't matter. This guy said, uh, beauty might be fulfilling, but its ubiquity renders it forgettable. When beauty is the aesthetic of the majority, fashion must resort to the ugly to retain its exclusivity. Or, putting it slightly more eloquently, uh, Oscar Wilde, he once said, uh, fashion is a form of ugliness so intolerable that we have to alter it every six months. So, this is true, right? Trendy people don't wear what the rest of us wear. Trendy people take things that the rest of us could not get away with and they find a way to make it work. And gradually over time, you know, it catches on, schlubs like me start wearing it and what was beautiful becomes ugly and what was ugly becomes beautiful and the circle just keeps on turning. Um, and so this is absolutely as true in, in, in your fashion and clothes and hair. It's equally true in design and in, in colors and in, in fonts and all of the things that go into design. So if you think that the interfaces over here have sort of uh, vanquished uh, these interfaces forever, uh, it's not true. These things will be back. And in fact, all you need to do is to go take a look at Dribble, uh, at the sort of trending popular shots section, and you will see designers playing with depth and shadow and gradients and uh, like serif fonts and skeuomorphism and all of these design things that were considered passe just a few years ago. Now, this is sort of this is, I guess, the playground of designers, but you will see this more and more start coming back into mainstream interface design. So what I'm saying here is I believe that designing how things work is a science, whereas designing how things look is really more of an art. Now, if designing how things work is a science, uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time asking, well, what kind of science thinking, what kind of scientific principles can help us uh, to design better user experience? How can we leverage that, that science-iness of user experience? Well, again, lots and lots of different ways. 
Um, lots of really good examples in Laura's presentation yesterday of, of, of principles that you can actually use. But um, I'm just going to focus on two. Uh, one of them is good old fashioned A-B testing. Now, uh, this is uh, super useful, and I'm sure you all, you know, most of you will be familiar with this. You make a small uh, change to your interface, you serve it up to different groups of people, and you measure the difference. Uh, really useful, really, really powerful tool in your UX toolkit, but I would warn you against a couple of um, mistakes that I see being made. One mistake is to do too much of it. Um, now, I believe that uh, these kinds of websites, your sort of e-commerce aggregation, you know, e-booking type things, booking.com, Expedia, these kinds of sites, I believe are really, really fanatical about A-B testing. They do a lot. Um, and you know, I believe they have, they have teams working on different parts of the website, running their own A-B tests and making these micro decisions right throughout the site. And, you know, and it works for them. Because these sites generally are a really high traffic, uh, low uh, margin website, so every bit of optimization makes a difference. So it works, but the result in most cases are websites that it's really, really hard to love, right? There's no emotional connection to these websites. They're very utilitarian. Um, and, and look, if you're working on a site like this, then go for it, you know, test everything. But I think probably most people in this room probably are working on apps or websites where you need a little more emotional connection. You need to stand out from the pack a bit more. And when you need that, that, that emotional connection, that's where visual design can really help you. Which of course leads to the question, uh, should you A-B test visual design? Now, you know, I'm, I'm sure some people would say yes, some people would say no. I asked Laura last night her opinion on this. Uh, should you A-B test your way to a sort of a visual design language? And I think her answer was fuck no. Um, <laughs> my, my answer is a slightly more diminutive, just, 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 just no. Look, you can, but honestly, the thing about visual design is it requires a vision. It requires a vision. And the thing about science is science doesn't care what you want to happen. Science does not care about anyone's vision. Science will give you an answer to your questions and you know, you'll aggregate all of those answers and you'll make those decisions, but uh, science doesn't care where you want to end up. And good design requires that you have someone's vision uh, driving what your app or your website is going to look like. Um, app design, website design, it's not paint by numbers. You, know, you can inform uh, that vision by data, but data shouldn't drive those decisions, again, in my opinion. Uh, one example of this, um, you know Marissa Meyer, she, um, she was at Yahoo, I don't know what she's doing now, but before Yahoo she, um, she worked at Google and she, oh for goodness, that is clearly not Marissa Meyer, that is quite clearly Zach Fitzwalter. <laughs> what is going on? Anyway, sorry, um, so Marissa Meyer, she, she was working at uh, Google and she once, apparently, the story goes, she uh, ordered the A-B testing of 41 different shades of blue for a toolbar, I think it was. 41. Now, here's the thing. Putting aside whether or not that's a good way to choose a colour, um, let me just put my scientist hat on here. Um, so, you know, when you're running these experiments, you are trying to determine whether you can uh, disprove the null hypothesis, right? The null hypothesis, I've got two blues, they're not any different. Uh, so you run your test, and if you find a result, hey, this blue is better. Uh, but there's a thing called type 1 errors, which is when you, you, you discount the null hypothesis when you shouldn't. It's a false positive. And the thing about type 1 errors is they become more likely the more tests you run. Now, <laughs> 41 different comparisons of blues, even if every single one of those tests yielded a statistically significant uh, difference, which I very much doubt, but let's just say it did, your chance of a type 1 error is more than 85%. Now, speaking of statistical significance, here's another thing to be aware of. Please, whatever you do, if you're running A-B tests, actually do the stats. Like seriously, save me from companies who, who run A-B tests. You'll hear them say, yeah, we, we ran the test and you know, we had a bit of a small sample size because we could only run it for a day, but uh, you know, and there was only a small difference between those two things, it was like two or three percent, but you know what, we really need to increase conversions, so we'll take that two or three percent and we're gonna go with B. Seriously, if, if you haven't found a statistically significant difference, or if your study is so underpowered that you can't even run the stats, or if you haven't even attempted to run the stats, you've just gone straight off those raw figures, the raw percent difference, 
You haven't found a small result. You have found nothing. That is not how science works. And seriously, you may as well and save the time and money of doing the test, just toss a coin and make your difference on that basis because it is the same thing. So what I'm saying is uh, science can help you with UX, but only if you actually do the science. Please do the science. Uh, so A-B testing, a great tool. Another tool uh, that I think is really useful, and it might be because it was my, um, the major of my undergrad degree, so I used it a little bit, is uh, behavioral psychology. So all of us, no matter what your website or your app is trying to do, you are trying to change behavior. You're in the business of behavior change. Um, trying to get people to use your app a lot, uh, to, to, to pay you money, to just use it a lot so you can generate data to sell ads against, or whatever you're doing, you're trying to change behavior. So um, have you ever heard of a man called B.F. Skinner? So he was an American psychologist who was uh, working mostly in the 1930s, and he was uh, responsible for a school of thought called operant conditioning. Now, you've probably heard of conditioning, and when you hear that word, you probably think of this. You probably think of dogs and bells and salivating, right? In fact, you have been conditioned to hear the word conditioning and to think of dogs and bells. But in fact, this wasn't Skinner. This was actually an earlier psychologist named uh, Ivan Pavlov, who, as you can see, was a very, very grainy individual. <laughs> now, um, so Pavlov, he, he did the stuff with the dogs and the bells, and the critical thing about Pavlov's work is that he was interested in stimuli that happened uh, before behavior. So the bell rang, that's the stimulus, the dog would associate that with food, and then would salivate, that's the behavior. So Skinner came along and he flipped that on its head, and he was interested in stimuli that happened after or as a result of behavior. So we all, we, we go through our day, we do things, we behave in all sorts of ways, and things happen. Good things happen, bad things happen. And uh, Skinner said that the relative mix of good and bad things that happen after we behave uh, determines whether or not we're likely to repeat that behavior. So say for example, just um, say one of your employees invites you to dinner and he offers you, uh, oh I forgot to say actually, so, so, so Pavlov, uh, his form of, of conditioning was known as classical conditioning or because of his name, uh, sometimes known as Pavlovian conditioning. Now. <laughs> can't miss that joke, come on. Uh, so, so anyway, back to this analogy where you're invited to dinner and, um, and so he offered you steamed clams and you like steamed clams so you're excited about that but it turns out that actually you misheard him and uh, you, uh, he actually made you steamed hams. Well that's disappointing so that might make you a little less likely to accept his invitation in the future. But say, for instance, it turns out that the steamed hams are actually quite tasty and you enjoy them and maybe later in the evening you get a glimpse of the Aurora Borealis, uh, localized entirely inside your host kitchen. Well, that would be, that would be cool. And, and the relative mix of those things, you know, that might counteract, that might outweigh the disappointment of the clam. So you might accept this invitation again. So this is operant conditioning, right? This, because the stimuli are operating on us. Now, um, we use this all the time. Even if uh, we've never heard of operant conditioning, we use it to train animals, of course. We use it to train children. Uh, we even use it to train adults through things like, uh, you know, bonuses and employee reward schemes and so on. So, um, so, so Skinner, he identified that there's a bunch of ways that this can happen. Uh, stimuli can be added or they can be taken away. And those stimuli that are added or taken away, they can be positive or negative. So if you add a positive consequence or you remove something negative, then you will probably increase the likelihood of that behavior happening. Conversely, if you punish someone by uh, adding a negative thing or removing a positive thing, you'll probably decrease the likelihood. Now we can use these principles in our user experience design. Uh, now some of these quadrants more than others. You're, you're probably not going to train your user by administering electric shocks through the device somehow or causing the device to catch on fire when they plug it in or something. That would be bad. <laughs> but, but, but look at this quadrant here. This stuff happens all the time. Uh, most of the time not intentional, uh, except perhaps like your freemium, you know, time limited, you know, you take something away, the ability to play. But sometimes this stuff is unintentional. Perhaps your app, um, it uses GPS or uh, you know, it's a real drain on the, on the GPU for some reason and you, you are draining the user's battery. Well, they can see that now in their settings. So they'll be aware of that and that will be a consequence. And if that is the case, you've got two options to mitigate that. You can either try and optimize your app to reduce its battery usage or if you can't do that, you better make sure that you are uh, giving some of these, right? Some of these positive consequences to try and balance that out. Likewise, with, uh, with purchases. 
right? If you are, people don't like their money being taken away, believe it or not. So if you are, have some purchase or you require the user to pay, you better make sure you provide good value for money. Now, of course, this stuff, it's not rocket surgery, right? We understand the stuff on a, you know, on a, on a basic level, but being able to sort of look at this through the prism of behavioral psychology helps us to, to, to make and to validate our decisions with a bit more robustness. Um, just to give you an example, um, uh, one of the, the sort of related principles is uh, the schedules of reinforcement. So Skinner used something that became known after the fact as a Skinner box. And honestly, his, his version was pretty, pretty awful. Uh, there's a rat and it pulls the lever and either gets a pallet of food or I'm, I'm really sorry to tell you, in some cases it got a mild electric shock. I'm sorry, science had no morals before. Luckily, by the time I was doing sort of lab work in this stuff at university, we, there were no rats, certainly no electric shocks. So we had a Skinner box that looked like this. And so we would have a, a chicken in the box, much like the, the chicken in this photo. What? Not a farm boy, are you? <laughs> so so we put the, the chicken in the box, and it would peck the disc, and, and we would reward it with food. And we learned about, look, if, if you reward the chicken every single time it pecks the disc, uh, you will, it will learn the behavior really quickly. That's called a, a fixed schedule of reinforcement. It'll learn the behavior but it will be weak behavior. If you stop rewarding the chicken, it will stop really quickly. On the other hand, if you use a variable ratio of, of reinforcement and you only uh, reinforce it every 10 picks or 20 or every 30 seconds, um, you will get, it will take longer, sure enough, but you'll get much stronger behavior. Now again, this stuff is super useful in our UX design because people really love getting tokens, like gamification, the stuff is really powerful. Um, so, um, and one interesting thing, social media apps actually have a, a sort of an inherent advantage here because of the nature of social networks. Right? You don't know when someone is going to reward someone by liking their post or retweeting their joke or whatever. That happens just randomly. So social networks just inherently get this variable ratio, but you can, you can create it in your apps uh, by using things like gamification. Now, I unfortunately, I don't have like time to go through specific examples of how you can use this, but I would encourage you to go away and to look into operant conditioning and UX. There's lots of really useful resources out there with practical ideas you can use. Now I bet there are some people here who are wondering, is this actually a moral thing to do? Should we be using psychological principles to train users to use our apps? And look, I would say if you are training children to buy your Smurf berries, then yeah, you might want to sort of examine your conscience on that. But Listen, you're like, is, is, this, is this immoral, right? Training the dog to do the right thing, is, is this immoral? I would argue that it's not so much about the tools that we use, but about the intent of your app, right? If you are a Quentin Zervais and you are helping people to build like really positive uh, habits in their life, right? So I guess I'm saying use your powers for good. Um, so again, to reiterate, science, I believe, can help you design great UX. I don't believe it can help you so much with designing beautiful UI. Now, some of you might have been to a talk that I gave uh, a couple of years ago here at DevWorld, um, uh, Design 101 for Programmers, and I just gave a bunch of little tips, and this was one of them. I, I talked about optical and mathematical alignment, and I showed this image, and I said, well, which one is aligned correctly? Of course, it's the one on the right, but then I pointed out, well, actually, math says that it's the one on the left. Uh, and you know, likewise, these ones are, are beautiful, they're exactly the same size and proportion and they're spaced equally, but they look much more harmonious and better spaced when we actually overflow that. So I showed, I said basically, I don't think mathematics is always a great designer, and I showed this slide here and said, <laughs> sometimes you just have to turn off the targeting computer and you have to use the force. And so I suppose what I'm saying this year is that this was just one small example of that, but I'm saying that this is true really of all visual design. You just have to use the force. Now, what if you don't feel like you are force gifted? Right? What if your midi chlorian count is a little bit low? <laughs> I'm sorry, the only advice I can give you is to find people with good taste and, and trust them. Like, like hire them if you can, or make friends with them, buy them coffee, uh, whatever you need to do to get their, their ideas, and then trust them. Because great visual design, it requires patient, meticulous execution of a vision. But you have to have that vision, you have to have that roadmap. I'm gonna finish today by uh, 
going back to this question, this whole thing, like, can you be a UI UX designer? Can you be both these things? Are these employers, are they realistic or not? And the answer to that question, can you be a UI, you know, a visual, good visual designer and a good user experience designer, in my opinion is, yes, of course you can, right? People are all sorts of things at the same time. I'm sure there are plumber slash bakers out there, <laughs> right? And, and in fact, I think that the sort of skill overlap um, here is much more than, you know, a plumber baker. Uh, the skills needed to be a good UX designer are pretty similar to a good visual designer. You need an eye for detail, you need good taste, you need empathy with the user. Um, but if you are hiring a plumber slash baker, you're probably going to be aware that you're not getting the very best plumber nor the very best baker that you can get. And the same is true here. Just think about the old, uh, the full stack developer. It's a real thing. I'm sure there's many in this room. Um, and, and they can be great on your team, real efficiencies, you can save money, all those things. But in most cases, all things being equal, they are probably not uh, as good a, a mobile or front end developer as someone who does that you know, every single day, right? Um, and in fact, in most cases, or, you know, or vice versa, and in most cases, they're probably maybe, uh, you know, mainly a back-end developer who dabbles in, in mobile or, or vice versa. It usually seems to be the way this goes. Uh, again, this is true with, uh, with design as well. So my final piece of advice is uh, to hire skills, not job titles. Now, obviously, not everyone in this room is hiring people, so uh, if you are someone who are uh, is presenting your skills, you might um, flip this round and talk about offering skills, not job titles. And what I mean is, uh, you need to consider these skills as different. So whether you're hiring uh, two people or one, uh, you need to ask different questions. If you are looking for a visual designer, then clearly you are going to spend a lot of time looking at examples of their work, right? That just makes sense. If you are looking for a user experience designer, then you probably want to spend less time looking at examples of their work and more time asking them questions about their process, about their achievements. How did you change systems? How did you improve uh, user acquisition or you know, satisfaction or whatever metrics are important to you? Um, and I can tell you, if you are hiring someone, if you're talking to someone who says they are a UX designer, but they can't answer those questions, you know, they don't want to talk about those kinds of things and they just want to show you their work, then you might consider that they maybe are more of a visual designer who dabbles in UX and maybe that's not actually what you want or need. Listen, there's so much more I would love to have spoken to you about, but you know, I'm out of time, so please uh, hit me up for f <laughs> Obviously, that's not me. That, that, that's, actually, that's actually a real designer, by the way. His, na his, his name is James White. Um, and I've got to tell you, this guy, he makes me feel inadequate in every way <laughs> that is possible for a designer and a man to feel inadequate. Like, look, the, his chin, his hair, his, his, like, um, this is his art, like amazing retro kind of neon. So I guess if you are looking for advice from a really, really talented Canadian designer, then hit up this James White on signalnoise.com, his website. On the other hand, if you're happy to just kind of pick the brains of an okay-ish sort of uh, designer slash developer, then uh, hit me up. And uh, I guess my last piece of advice is if you're going to pay someone to help you with your slides, maybe pay them more than $5. Um, that's it. How do I go for time? Oh, good time. We've got some time. Yep. Yeah, Thank you. Please clap.